Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and uh, worshiping with us today. Happy Sunday. Uh, also, thank you for those of you who are joining on live stream. It's great to be with you this morning, and uh, we're so glad you're here. If you're new or visiting with us today, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Thank you so much for being with us. If you have any questions about St. Paul's or anything going on here in our community, please feel free to ask me or Pastor Ryan after service. We'd love to get to know you a little better and talk to you uh, about what's going on here in our community. We have a couple quick announcements today before we get to our, our worship music and our sermon. Welcome back to Pastor Ryan. We'll, we're going to be returning to our Galatians series today. Really looking forward to that. And if, uh, if you missed any of Matt Ricci, who was here the past two weeks, I just want to encourage you to go online, listen to his messages. They were great, and uh, we were so fortunate to have him join us the past two weeks and to hear about what's going on with him and what's going on in campus, uh, his campus ministry in China with uh, Campus Target. So uh, a couple quick announcements. One is uh, if you've never done Strength Finders, just want to uh, encourage you to uh, reach out to Pastor Ryan sometime this week or the next week. Uh, what Strength Finders is, it's basically a way to get to know what your gifts and talents are. Uh, not just for church life, but it is great for church life and for helping out the community, but also just in uh, everyday life, what, what you're going through. I did that a couple years ago, and it was just really eye-opening to me to see that I wasn't really using the strengths that I had uh, and that the Lord gave me, so I kind of switched careers and then made a big switch in my life because of that, because of that test, so uh, that was one of the factors. So if you've never done that, I uh, highly encourage you to check that out. You go through an assessment, and Pastor Ryan will walk you through all of that, and it's just a great way, again, to get to know uh, your strengths and how you could be uh, helping out society and our community even more. Uh, another announcement, Friday, August 27th, and Saturday, August 28th, Husky Wow uh, is having a resource fair for any first year or second year students. Usually it's just a first year event, but because of COVID and uh, everyone learning online last year, they're also having the second year students there as well. We're going to have a table for St. Paul's at that at resource event at that fair. So we would love for some St. Paul's members to be there to welcome the students back, uh, let them know about St. Paul's, let them know uh, how they can get here and just uh, different things that are going on here this fall. So if that's something that you'd be interested in, if you'd like to get to know some more UConn students and um, encourage them to come to St. Paul's, we'd love for you to uh, be at that event. Uh, myself, Pastor Ryan, I think Pamela, we're all going to be uh, at the table. So we would love for you guys to join us for that. And that's uh, 10 to 3 on January, tw uh, August 27th and August 28th. And then the final announcement is uh, something that we talked about a few months ago, and we're just going to uh, bring it back up because it'll be coming here soon enough, is we're going to have a youth uh, group over the, the next year where Pastor Ryan's going to be examining the core of our Christian faith and walking the youth through the Apostles' Creed. So uh, he's looking for some fun and creative ways to do that with the youth. If, uh, if you are a youth and you're someone who is in 8th grade to 12th grade, and uh, now's a great time. If there's someone in, your, on your, in one of your friend groups that have been maybe asking you questions about your faith, this is just a great way to invite them and uh, get them to come, come to St. Paul's and hear from Pastor Ryan on a monthly basis and uh, just get to know the Christian faith a little more. So that will be coming up this fall, more info to come. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to email Pastor Ryan at ryan at stpaulswire.org. Everyone should have a little card on your table, a connection card. Uh, you can also do this virtually. This is just a great way to let us know you're here worshiping with us this morning. You could fill one of them out on the way out of service today, put, put it in the offering basket. And on the back of those cards is a place for your prayer requests and praises. And uh, we have a prayer team who prays over these cards and over the needs of our church each and every week. So we'd love to hear from you and how we could be praying for you in this upcoming week. At this time, would you please uh, join me for our weekly prayer? Would you mind uh, standing? Because uh, after prayer, we'll go right into worship. This week's prayer comes from Ignatius Loyola. Lord Jesus Christ, fill us. We pray with your life and light that we may show forth your wonderful glory. Grant that your love may so fill our lives that we may count nothing too small to do for you, nothing too much to give, and nothing too hard to bear. Amen. <laughs> Morning, St. Paul's. Joy of the Lord is our strength. 
break We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we say And everyone say Holy is the Lord Sin runs deep 
Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are, Lord I am free Holiness Is Christ in me And where Where you are, are, Lord I am free Holiness Is Christ in me Lord, I need you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and strength When When I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and strength Lord, I need you everybody. It's uh, good to be back after two weeks away. Uh, Like Keith said, if you guys didn't hear Matt Ricci's messages from the last two weeks, I really encourage you to go and listen to them. He did an awesome job, so I really appreciated what he had to say. Uh, And as Keith said, we are returning to our Galatians series today, so if you have a Bible, I encourage you to make your way to where we left off a couple weeks ago, uh, chapter 3 starting in verse 19. Um, but uh, before we get into, it, into this, let's uh, say a prayer together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you for uh, the chance to be together, to worship you, to seek you together. Lord, we pray that you would focus our hearts and, and attention on you and on your word right now. Uh, Lord, we pray against the, uh, the rise in COVID cases. Uh, we pray that in the near future, COVID would be something that we just don't need to worry about anymore, Lord. And we pray that you would help us to all take whatever steps we need to take in order to uh, help ensure that, Lord. And uh, Father, we just pray that you continue to sustain our community uh, during this difficult and unusual time. Uh, We give you thanks, Lord, for your presence with us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so before we uh, read this passage, let me set the stage a little bit. If you've been around church very long, chances are you've heard somebody say, you should read the Bible, right? That's something that we talk about here. You should read the Bible. Reading the Bible is an important discipline of our faith. It's uh, one of the primary ways that we get to know God. But isn't it true that there are a lot of parts of the Bible where it's hard to know what to do with them, right? So, for example, imagine one day you're looking for some guidance from God, so you just take out your Bible and you 
throw it open to a random page and then you put your finger down in a random spot and let's say it lands on Leviticus 19.19, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. So does that mean you need to get rid of all your blended fabrics that those kinds of clothes are dishonoring to God? Is this a sign that you need to repent of wearing blended fabric? Say you uh, do the same thing, open up to a different part of the Bible, put your finger down randomly, and it lands on Leviticus 11, 9 through 12. Of all the creatures living in the water of the seas and the streams, you may eat any that have fins and scales, but all creatures in the seas or streams that do not have fins and scales, you are to regard as unclean. Would you take this as a sign that you need to repent of eating lobster, clams, shrimp, calamari? Are these things detestable to God? Or say you do it again and your finger lands on Leviticus 19.27. Do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. Does this mean that God really likes mutton chops? Is it dishonoring to God not to grow out your sideburns? Is that how you honor God as a man? Well, if you have heard any of the messages in Galatians so far, you know that Paul has been arguing that the answer to the questions I've just asked is no. No, we are not under the law anymore. Um, All of these are from the Mosaic law, the law that was given from God to Moses, Um, and we, in the time that we are living now, after Jesus has come and the Spirit has been sent, is a time where we are no longer under the law. We are considered to be under the Spirit now, instead of under the law. And so far, Paul has made several arguments to defend his position. Some false teachers have been trying to argue otherwise, trying to argue that if you're going to be in the family of God, you have to abide by all these these laws, and Paul has been mounting this defense, arguing for why, no, no, the the law is no longer necessary. And just to give a quick overview of what Paul said so far, um, one of the arguments he's made is, we're not under the law anymore because think about this, the Son of God was crucified. That is a paradigm-shifting event. You should realize that if, if God incarnate suffered this humiliating, awful death, that wasn't just to maintain the status quo. Okay, things have changed. Another reason Paul says that we're not under the law anymore is because we can see that the Holy Spirit is being given to Gentiles. The Holy Spirit is working among people, men who are not circumcised, people who don't worry about the composition of their clothes, people who don't keep kosher. The Holy Spirit is inspiring them to believe in Jesus and to orient their lives around him. The Holy Spirit is working miracles among these Gentiles. So clearly this is a sign that obedience to the Mosaic Mosaic law is not a requirement for belonging in the family of God. And then the third argument Paul's made so far, he's, he's used the story of Abraham from the Old Testament, the example of Abraham. All Jews regarded Abraham as their spiritual father. And he said... Abraham, remember, Abraham was recognized as part of the family of God hundreds of years before the Mosaic Law was even given. So clearly, obedience to the Mosaic Law can't be this absolute essential to being accepted by God, because our spiritual father, Abraham, didn't even have the law, right? So this is the case that Paul has made so far, but all this raises a question which is, then what was the point of the law? And, you know, that was a very important for Jews, a question for Jews at the time, because they had oriented their lives around the Mosaic Law. And obviously, that should be an important question for us today as well, because we value the Bible, right? And part of the Bible includes the Mosaic Law, right? So this is a very relevant question. What's the point of the law? And that's the question that Paul is going to address in this next section 
that we're looking at. He's going to confront that question head on. And I think what he says can be very helpful for us as we try to understand and apply certain parts of the Bible today. So, let's look at what he says. Galatians 3, starting in verse 19. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party. But God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. All right, I know that was a lot to take in, some of it pretty confusing, But the way that I want to unpack this passage is by asking a question. And the question is, how should we think about the law? And I think that Paul gives us three guiding principles here that can be really helpful. And the first one, if you're taking notes, number one, how should we think about the law? The law was given to reveal sinfulness. The law was given to reveal sinfulness. Look at verse 19 again. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions. Now the key to understanding what Paul is saying here is to know what that word transgressions means. Transgression means to break a law. You actually can't transgress anything unless there is a law in place. So when Paul says the law was given because of transgressions, it's like he's saying the law was given for the sake of law breaking. Now, does this mean that it's good to break the law? No, that's not what Paul is saying. But what Paul is saying is the law was given so that the law-breaking nature of people might be revealed. People are going to sin whether there's a law or not. But when there's a law, there's a standard that makes it clear that they are sinning, right? So what the law did was it created this very clear standard which then could be transgressed, and the transgressing revealed that Israel had a problem with sin, a heart problem that they could not deal with in their own strength. So this is part of the reason that the law was given, to illuminate this problem of sinfulness. Uh, When I was on vacation last week in Tennessee, we went to the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, And uh, there was this one room where, kind of inconspicuously in one part of the room, there was a chest, and the chest had a sign on it that said, please do not open. And, of course, about half the people that walked by it tried to open it. And that was fine because it was all a joke, of course, and when you opened it, it made this horrible hissing noise and a scream, and, you know, it was a joke, okay? Now, I suspect that if that sign wasn't on the chest, most people would have never cared about that chest. They would have just walked by it, right? But because there was a sign that said, please do not open this, people were curious, right? And people felt inspired to transgress the law that had been given to them. And I think that's a good illustration of what what the law does. The law provides these standards, which people then transgress, and in transgressing, that reveals this disobedient nature that the people have. The law revealed the people's unwillingness to be obedient to God. So, uh, when we read the Mosaic Law, we have to keep that in mind, right? Part of the purpose of the law was to reveal the sinfulness of Israel. It wasn't given to make them sin. That's not the right way of thinking about it. They would have sinned with or without the law, but the law helped to expose the problem. So, 
That's the first thing that we should keep in mind, how we should think about the law. Number two, how should we think about the law? The law was a temporary step in God's plan of salvation. A temporary step in God's plan of salvation. Paul says, it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred to had come. That word until is very important, right? It means that the law had a purpose, but only for a set period of time, until Jesus came. All right? Now, you might wonder, this is a question I've wondered myself, why couldn't God have just skipped the law? Why couldn't he have just gone straight from Abraham to Jesus? Why have the Mosaic Law at all? Well, only God really knows the answer to that question. But we need to, what we need to realize is that asking that question is a little bit like asking, why does there need to be a process at all to history? Why can't we just skip to heaven? Why can't we just skip to the kingdom of God fully realized on earth? And I don't know for sure, but what I am confident of is that God values the process. God values process. He's like a loving parent in that way. If you're a parent, you don't ask, why can't my baby just be grown up and mature right away? Right? That's not a question you ask. If you're a parent, you patiently guide your child through all that child's stages of development. Right? And you just recognize this is the way it works. There's a process. And God is like a loving, patient parent with humanity and with all of his creation, really. At one point in history, God having patient guidance of humanity meant giving the Mosaic Law. But that doesn't mean that all of the law is relevant for us now. You know, just like your training wheels were relevant for you on your bike when you were five years old, but hopefully they're not still relevant for you when you're 25. The law had a purpose, but it was a temporary one. So that's number two. Number three. How should we think about the law? The law was given to guard Israel from straying. The law was given to guard Israel from straying. Let's look at one part of the passage again. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Now the question we should be asking ourselves is, what is a guardian? Well, in the Greco-Roman world at the time, it was common for boys to have guardians. And a guardian was a servant who supervised the boy whenever the boy went out of the house. So, N.T. Wright, actually, he's a famous uh, biblical scholar. He translates this word guardian as babysitter. These servants, they would walk the boys to school, make sure that they didn't go off, off path, make sure that they didn't skip class. Right? Um, they, were, they were supervisors of young boys. Um, so when we read the Mosaic Law today, we should keep that metaphor in mind. Part of the purpose of these laws was to keep Israel on the right track until maturity arrived. Boys didn't have guardians forever. Right? Once they reached maturity, once they reached adolescence, the time for having a guardian was over. And similarly, once the Messiah, Jesus, came to Israel, Israel reached maturity and no longer needed to be under the guardianship of the law. That's the analogy that Paul is making here. Now you might ask, okay, well, how did the law keep Israel from straying? How did it accomplish that? Well, there are several ways, but one of the biggest ways is that it kept Israel worshiping the true God and not going away and being distracted by false gods. Now, of course, it didn't always accomplish this because Israel was always tempted to worship false gods, but it helped to restrain that impulse. You might ask, well, why was Israel always tempted to worship these false gods? Well, the way to think about it is because in those days, right, you wanted control over an uncontrollable world. 
You wanted assurance that you weren't going to get sick and die and that your crops weren't going to fail and that sort of thing. So you thought, well, praying to Yahweh right now, I'm still having a crop failure or I'm still getting sick. So maybe I should try worshiping that other nation's God and maybe that nation's God will give me what I want. But God did not want Israel to do that, right? God wanted Israel to trust him, the true God, and him alone. And the law helped to provide barriers so that Israel would not intermingle with other nations and then be corrupted by their false religion, their false gods, their false ideologies. So how did the law do that? Well, think about it. If you have a bunch of dietary restrictions, you're not going to be as likely to eat with foreigners or to eat in foreign places, right? That's like a vegan trying to get lunch in Bear Smokehouse. It's just, it's too complicated. It's awkward. It doesn't work, right? So the law helped to keep you separate. You know, similarly, if you're not supposed to wear certain fabrics, you're going to be less likely to buy clothes from other nations, right? The law helps to keep you separate, and in keeping you separate, it helps to keep you uncorrupted by false religion, false worship, false ideology. The law also helped Israel to stay on track in worshiping God because it, it forced them to bring the worship of God into their daily activities, right? What, what they ate, cleanliness, how they wore their hair, that sort of thing. If you're constantly mindful of God's will in these simple daily activities, it helps to keep you on track like that guardian, making sure you go to school, making sure you don't skip class. The law is a guardian. All right. Now, I want to offer a fourth point for how we should think about the law. And for this one, we're actually going to have to go outside of the passage and look at something that Jesus said. So, point number four, the law is not a perfect expression of God's will. The law is not a perfect expression of God's will. How can we be sure of that? Well, the reason I say this is because of a very interesting passage, Matthew 19... The Pharisees come to Jesus and they ask him a question. They ask him about, about divorce. Uh, they say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Isn't it interesting that they thought that this was a good question? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? She burnt my dinner. Can I divorce her? They think this is a good question. So Jesus responds, and he says, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. So what Jesus does is he reminds them of when marriage is instituted at the very beginning of the Bible. And he says, Don't you remember that when marriage is first described, it's described as two becoming one. So it's crazy to think that you should be able to divorce someone for any and every reason, right? This is supposed to be a relationship where the two have become one. It's, it's not a union that's supposed to be dissolved frivolously. It's serious, right? So then the Pharisees reply, and when they reply, they reveal why they thought this was a good question in the first place. They say, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And they're right about that. There's a place in the law where it gives instructions for what a man should do when he wants to divorce his wife. It says that he should give her a certificate of divorce. So look at what Jesus says in response. He says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. That's pretty significant 
that, Moses, that he says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Let's think about that. Jesus is saying, the law was given because people were sinful. God knew that regardless of what he commanded, some men were going to divorce their wives for bad reasons. God knew that. God knew that these men were hard-hearted. And so because of that, God provided instructions for what should be done when that happens. And the instruction was they should give a certificate of divorce to their ex-wives. And God instructed this not because he's fine with divorce, not because he thinks that it's a perfectly acceptable thing, but because he knows that people are sinful and they're going to do it. Does that make sense? And the instructions that God gave in the Mosaic Law regarding divorce were probably to help protect the woman. Because if a woman had a certificate of divorce, that meant that she was no longer bound to a man, and it freed her to be able to marry someone else. Which, in those days, was very important, because it was a very patriarchal society, and if a woman was unmarried, she was going to have a hard time surviving. So, what Jesus is implying here is that the law is not this perfect expression of God's will for our lives. It was a set of instructions given to sinful people. At that time in history, the world was extremely patriarchal. Slavery was very common. And we can see that reflected in parts of the law when we read it now. But we shouldn't conclude from that 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 means that God's ideal is a world where women aren't treated well or a world where people have slaves just as it wasn't God's ideal for men to divorce their wives, right? So the main point here is some of the laws God gave were because people's hearts were hard, because people were sinful, because he knew they were going to behave sinfully, and so the laws he, he gave were intended to help restrain the effects of sin. For example, to restrain the effects of patriarchy, to restrain the effects of slavery, right? Now, his laws did not demand a complete overturning of the social order, but they did restrain the negative aspects of that social order. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, you might ask, well, why didn't God just completely overturn the social order? Why didn't he do that? Well, because God is patient. Because God values the process. right? Because God doesn't just override human brains and culture. God meets people where they're at. And, and he meets them in their sinfulness, and then he patiently guides them. That's the way God works. So what does all that mean for us? Well, it means that if we want to know what God is like and what God's will is, we cannot just look at the Mosaic Law. We can't. We have to look at Jesus. The New Testament tells us that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The exact representation of God's being. It never says that the Mosaic Law is the exact representation of God's being. As Jesus said, the Mosaic Law reflected the hard-heartedness of human beings, right? But Jesus is the exact representation of the being of God. Similarly, uh, similarly Colossians 2.9 says, uh, For in Christ the fullness of the deity lived in bodily form. If we are going to take the whole Bible seriously, we have to look to Jesus as the clearest, fullest, supreme revelation of the character of God. And then when we know the character of Jesus, we can look back at the Mosaic Law and we can recognize where it reflects the character of God. And we can also recognize the times when it's reflecting the hard-heartedness of the people who God was working with in that time. 
There's a New Testament scholar named Scott McKnight, who I appreciate, and uh, he gives an analogy for how to think about the law that I find helpful. And I'll, I'll close with this. He says that we should think of life under the law like a typewriter, but think of life under the spirit like a computer. You know, a typewriter has the same layout of keys as a computer, right? And similarly, the law operates according to the same basic principles as life under the Holy Spirit. I mean, Jesus summarized the law as two commands, love God and love your neighbor. And that's the same thing that the Holy Spirit guides us in doing, loving God and loving our neighbor, right? Same basic organi organizing principle to both the law and life under the Spirit. But the law, like a typewriter, was for a particular time, right? It would be silly to use a typewriter now. I mean, I think there are a few hipsters who do it, but generally speaking, uh, it would be silly to use a typewriter. Um, computers just get the job done so much better, right? If we want to love God and love our neighbor well today, we should be focused on Jesus and life through the Holy Spirit, right? Going back to the law is like trying to do word processing on a typewriter instead of a computer. Yes, it has the same basic organizing principle, but it's just not going to get the job done as well in our time and place as using the computer, life under the spirit. The computer, you might say, brought the typewriter to fulfillment, right? And similarly, Jesus and the Holy Spirit brought the law to fulfillment. So, all that to say, we probably shouldn't be opening the Bible today to random spots and putting our finger down and concluding that that tells us what the God, will of God is for us in this moment, right? We have to be very careful about that sort of thing. Because what we land on when we do that might be a command given to hard-hearted people for a temporary period of time before Jesus came and before the Holy Spirit was sent. So to put it metaphorically, our finger might land on a command to people who only had typewriters. But today we have access to computers. Right? We need to take the whole Bible seriously but the key to doing that is taking Jesus seriously. And that means recognizing that the law doesn't apply to us in the same way that it did then. And thank God for that, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, uh, it can be challenging sometimes to know how to read and understand certain parts of the Bible. And we pray that you would just help us to think well about the scriptures, to understand the big picture, the big story. Uh, and Lord, we just pray that Jesus and the Holy Spirit would guide how we understand the whole story. Um, Lord, give us wisdom. And Lord, we, we thank you and celebrate the fact uh, that we are not under the, under the law the way the Israelites were. We thank you that through Jesus, through your sacrifice on the cross, uh, you have ushered in a new age. Uh, we thank you that we are no longer under the guardianship of the law. And Lord, we pray that you would bring us to, to full maturity as people who, who love you and love our neighbors uh, exactly as you intend. In Jesus' name, amen. Die. 
blindness from me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. No sweeter name have I ever known No sweeter name than the name of Jesus No sweeter name than the name of Jesus No sweeter name have I ever known No sweeter name than the name of Jesus You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. service where we continue our worship through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Here at St. Paul's, we encourage you to participate in the Lord's Supper as long as you have put your faith in Jesus. Now, you don't have to be a member here. Um, no qualifications other than you believe in him, you're trusting in him. And if you're not sure what that means, uh, I invite you to talk to me at some point about that. You can email me Ryan at stpaulswire.org, and I would love to, to talk more about that with you. Uh, if you did not receive any elements on your way into service, uh, and you would like some, please raise your hand right now, and Caleb can come and bring you some. And if you're watching from home, we encourage you to participate, uh, find something in your home akin to uh, the bread and the wine, and uh, let's remember Jesus in the way that he commanded us to remember him together. Uh, before we receive the elements this morning, uh, I thought it would be good if we could together uh, recite a prayer of confession. Um, and Caleb, I believe you'll have this on the slides. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so why don't we, uh, if, you, if you're able, let's stand together and prepare our hearts to receive. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. You may be seated. And right now we celebrate together that because of what Jesus has done, uh, the sins that we have confessed are forgiven. Uh, that through him we have unbelievable grace and forgiveness and reconciliation with God. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. Stand in here in your presence thinking of the good things you have done Waiting here patiently Just to hear your still small voice again Holy, righteous, faithful to the end Savior, healer, redeemer and friend and I will worship you for who you are I will worship you for who you are I will worship you for who you are Jesus your presence thinking of the good things you have done waiting here patiently just to hear your still small voice again holy righteous faithful to the end savior healer redeemer You for who you are, I will worship you for who you are, I will worship you for who you are, Jesus. And I will worship you for who you are, I will worship you for who you are, I will worship you for who you are. Always, my 
your promise sure, your love endures always. And I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are, Jesus. You for who you are, I will worship you for who you are, I will worship you for who you are, Jesus. Amen. We'd invite you to rise and join us today for our closing song as you're able. Thank you so much for being here today. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing Love so amazing Jesus Messiah Name above all names Blessed Redeemer Emmanuel Rescue for sinners Ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth shook and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, arrested for sin. Ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. All our hope, all our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you, God. Messiah, a name above all things, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, bless you for sinners, ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue 
for sinners Ransom from heaven Jesus Messiah If you didn't fill out a connection card, we encourage you to fill one out, especially if you have any prayer requests. Uh, you can place them in the basket on, the way, on your way out. If you can't find the basket, just leave it somewhere in the room and we'll make sure to grab it. Uh, but we have a team that prays faithfully over those cards every week. If you have any requests uh, and you're watching online, you can also submit uh, one through the form that Keith provided earlier in the comments section. Or you can just email one of us and we would be happy to pray for you. Uh, also, if you're interested in being baptized, uh, we do want to hold a baptism service before the summer is over. And uh, so you need to take a class, a short class, if you want to be baptized to determine if it's right for you. So email me if you're interested in taking that class, ryan at stpaulswire.org. And also, if you're interested in participating in a small group Bible study, uh, please email me as well. Uh, we'll see what we can do about that. So let's say our benediction. While our service here has now ended, our worship has not ended, because our worship never ends. Now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>